Thank you very much for that very generous introduction. Thank you for your invitation. Thank you for your hospitality. It's a real pleasure to be here with you all in Santiago and having the opportunity to share with you some of the research that we are doing at Oxford University where we try to understand how artificial intelligence is reshaping the world of work and what that might mean for the future. Now, unfortunately, the only thing that we do know about the future is that we are pretty bad at predicting it. But as I will argue in this presentation, fortunately, there are things that we can learn from history. Uh, it would be hard to argue against the proposition that electrification was a transformative event. And many today are suggesting that artificial intelligence is the new electricity, which like other general purpose technologies transformed the way we produce, transformed the way we consume, transformed our homes and our lives more broadly. But even as electric appliances enter our homes, electric machinery entered our factories, and electric streetlight made our cities better and brighter, it doesn't meant that everybody automatically benefited from this transformation. Lamplighters, for example, who used to light the street lamps in the evenings using torches and ladders, lost their jobs, and they didn't go down without the fight. In Brussels, the situation escalated, ended in lamplighters raiding police headquarters, and the army was sent in to resolve the situation. Even things that can lead to long-run outcomes that raises standards of living and prosperity the short run is a different matter. And I think no event illustrates this better than the first industrial revolution. Before the first industrial revolution, which took off in Britain around 1800, incomes per capita were stagnant and very low for most or all of human history. And they take off in extraordinary fashion as machines proliferate across factories and across the globe. And they have raised standards of living, made new goods uh, available to us, reduced working hours, and uh, even improved working conditions. Most people today work in air-conditioned offices. That is quite different from the coal mines of the 1800s. But if we zoom in on the first industrial revolution itself, we see a very different picture. Much like today, in fact, there was a lot of argument about whether we should even industrialize. In one novel called Coningsby, Benjamin Disraeli, before he became Prime Minister of Britain, has a character that remarks, I see cities peopled with machines. Certainly Manchester must be the most wonderful place of modern time. The very same year that Coningsby was published, Frederick Engels published his work on the uh, conditions of the working class in Britain. And needless to say, he had a very different take what was happening to average people. He argued that machinery uh, is unnatural because it puts people in repetitive motions, um, which he deemed to be unnatural. And in addition to that, he argued that machinery would put downward pressure of people's wages and lead to the immiseration of the working class. And with the benefit of hindsight, uh, it is easy to ridicule such predictions. But Engels was actually fairly on target about the period he lived through because for about seven decades, as the British economy took off and GDP per capita grew by some 50%, wages were stagnant and probably even falling at the lower end of the income distribution. The famous Luddites who rioted against the mechanized factory were not misinformed by any means. For them, opposition to progress made sense because they were not the ones that stood to benefit from it. And what economists regard as being the short run during the first industrial revolution was seven decades. It was two generations that didn't see any meaningful improvements in their standing of living as uh, new technologies proliferated. Now, 
where am I going with all of this? Obviously, the age of AI is not the same as the first industrial revolution, but there are some patterns that do rhyme. Like we saw staggering increases in income inequality during the first industrial revolution, we've seen income inequality creeping up again in the age of computers. And that might not be that bad if everybody benefits and people at the top just benefit a bit more. But the fact is that we've seen entire groups in the labor market seeing their earnings capacity being reduced. Um, around 1970, wages stagnated for most people as a result of the oil price shock. And beginning in the 1980s, as computers begin to proliferate across the economy, we see wages even decline, predominantly among men with no more than a high school degree who would have flocked into factory jobs before the dawn of automation. This data is from the United States. It's extremer there, but you see a similar pattern across much of the OECD. Um, so, there have been losses to computerization, just as we saw during the first Industrial Revolution. And the question, of course, is why? Two key explanations exist, and they both relate to technology. One has to do with globalization and offshoring to countries like China, which would be completely infeasible if it wasn't for computers. But the truth is, is that if you look at value added, if you look at just the amount of stuff that's being produced in advanced economies like the United States, there's still a lot of stuff being produced, but it's just being produced with fewer workers pointing to robots entering the factories and other technologies increasing productivity uh, in ways that is reducing the demand for labor. Even in China today, we're seeing manufacturing jobs disappearing from its peak as it's becoming the largest market for robots in the world. And of course, many development economists now worry that China might be one of the last countries riding the wave of industrialization to prosperity um, as it is no longer absorbing a significant amount of the workforce in many developing and emerging economies. Meanwhile, in advanced economies, this is having significant political economy effects. Just people showed their dissatisfaction with what the market, uh, with the verdict of the market during the first industrial revolution. Today, we see the rise of populism primarily in places that have deindustrialized very rapidly. If you want to understand why three key swing states, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, that were part of the Democratic Blue Belt, ended up being won by Trump in the 2016 elections, deindustrialization and the proliferation of robots is a very big part of that story. And even if you look within those states, you find that electoral districts, which were more exposed to automation, were most likely to vote for the Republican candidate, and we see similar patterns, uh, not just in the United States and Europe, but they go again across the OECD. Now, a key question is obviously how this is likely to develop as a result of technologies like generative AI. Some people suggest that AI might even be a reversal of this trend because it makes job easier for novices and people with lower skills. Think about it. If you're Dostoevsky, you wouldn't be benefit that much from ChatGPT. But if you're not a very good writer, well, with the help of ChatGPT, you can become an average writer. If you're not a very good uh, coder, well, with the help of GitHub's Copilot, you beca can become an average coder. And a number of studies have shown that it's actually novices and low-skilled workers that have benefited the most from generative AI as of now. But that, again, doesn't mean that everybody will benefit. It means lower barriers to entry in content creating professions. And we've seen this movie before again and again in the digital economy. Think of a technology like Uber what uh, the Uber app and the arrival of GPS technology did is making it an unnecessary skill to know the name of every single street in a city like Santiago. 
And, and what that means is that everybody with a driver's license could essentially get into a taxi and um, earn a little bit of income on the side. But that wasn't good news for incumbent drivers. And in fact, as more people entered into taxi services, you saw incumbent drivers take a wage cut of around 10%. And as a consequence, we've seen unrest on the streets of Paris, London, many cities in the United States, and I'm told um, also to some degree here in Chile. Um, and I think it's important to remember that uh, when it comes to generative AI, we are likely to see similar effects unless people begin to uh, consume a lot more content, right? If people consume a huge amounts of new content, we might see more better paid jobs rather than people competing for, a sixth, uh, for an existing lump of demand. Unfortunately, I don't think we're very likely to see that increase in demand simply because there's only so much content that you can consume in a given day, right? Think about it. If Netflix became a lot cheaper and better, you wouldn't watch it twice as much. You just wouldn't have uh, the time, uh, just like I don't. And so as a consequence of this, we are likely to see the same sort of resistance across a lot of professions that we have seen playing out in Hollywood over recent months, where actors and screenwriters for the first time in 50 years banded together and cut a deal to protect their jobs and wages. Now, the reason that the future is so hard to predict is that it depends on what we do, right? And I think Leontief was onto something when he suggested that if horses could have joined the Democratic Party and voted, what happened on the farms might have turned out differently. They might have used their political clout to spread the tractor, uh, to hinder the spread of the tractor. And in similar fashion, if we look around the world today, if progress was a natural, why isn't, if progress was natural, why isn't every country developed? If progress was natural, why did we have to wait to 1800 to have the first industrial revolution? There's nothing natural about it at all, and it needs to be protected. But the way of protecting it is to make sure that even though it has this promise of delivering a lot of tremendous things in the future, if you think of AI, reducing uh, barriers to entry in content creation, that will boost some people's wages. If you think of uh, AI and its use in medical discovery, that has the potential to cure um, a wide range of diseases. But in order to get there, we need to realize that we need to manage the short run. And unless people today feel that they benefit throughout the transition, why should they opt for technological progress? There was nothing inherently irrational in what the Luddites did. They didn't stand to benefit from technological progress, so opposition made sense. What we need to do today is to leverage policies through our educational and welfare systems to help people throughout this transition. And that is not just be uh, helping the people that are directly affected by it, it's helping society as a, as a whole, um, because unless we do that, we're likely to be precluded from the long-run gains from these technologies. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>